Dean Slater has been covering the Dallas Cowboys for the NFL Network for a long time, based in Dallas, Texas, which is where you are when you cover the Cowboys. Jane, follow her on Twitter at, at SlaterNFL. Uh, she's part of the NFL Network's Inside the Training Camp Live coverage. Starts tomorrow through August 7th, every day at 10 a.m. Eastern. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Um, let's start with the obvious stuff. Do you think Zeke shows up to camp? I do. Okay. And here's why. I know that there's been these media reports out there that he's anticipating a holdout. But in talking to my sources inside the building, they don't anticipate that he's going to do that. I think this is his management making sure that he's part of the conversation because we're talking about Amari Cooper and Dak Prescott's contract. But here's what I know about Zeke. This is my fourth season with the NFL Network. We came in at the same time together. I saw him go through all of that with the commissioner and the six-game suspension. He would still show up to practice, put his head down, and get to work. And I think he respects his teammates. His teammates respected him the way that he stepped up in that leadership role last year. I don't think that this comes down to him holding out and staying away from his team. That's just not what I've seen from him and not what I'm being told from inside the building. So you got into the Cowboys uh, pre-Dak Prescott. There's been a lot of questions about what they pay him, but let's get down to the human part. Do you believe in that locker room that Dallas Cowboy players believe in Dak? Absolutely. And I think that's the main reason. You know, when Tony Romo came back from the injury, he wasn't even allowed to compete for his job. That's, a lot of people didn't realize that or remember that. That because his his retirement speech, wasn't it impromptu? It was an impromptu speech that I was told not a lot of people were privy to. So they were as equally shocked that he was passing the torch on that some felt that wasn't his torch to pass necessarily. And so the fact that they, this was a guy that a lot of people also don't remember. It was Tony Romo, Kellen Moore, Jamil Showers, who now plays on defense, and right. then Dak Prescott. So the fact that they saw something in him so early and weren't willing to bring back a guy like Tony Romo, who had such an emotional attachment to that front office as well as that locker room, to me said a lot about who Dak Prescott is as a guy. And if you see him, they do these captain retreats where they go fishing. He hangs out with these guys. It's all about dominoes. He is, the one thing I will say about Dak is none of this has phased him. He is completely unchanged. I have not seen a difference in him from four-string Dak to franchise guy with the star on his helmet. Yeah, Dak is um, one of the, you can tell a lot about a person. You become your personality. Aaron can be a little condescending, Aaron Rodgers, mm -hmm. and sometimes he led the NFL in throwaways, which can be a little dismissive of the coaching staff. Brady is willful and focused, and that's how he plays. Uh, Dak's a grown-up. Dak is a, he's a, he walked into this league, like I, I would say like Andrew Luck and Russell Wilson, and you put him in front of a mic, and he takes all the arrows, and he's a grown-up. I mean, they, Dallas had this anthem controversy, and Dak stood up and said, um, I, I'm with my owner on this. And that was a, that's a hard thing to do in today's social media. Lost in all the cowboy talks and contract is Jason Garrett. Jane, do you feel um, Dallas, Jerry doesn't like to fire coaches. He usually gives them a year more than the public or media would. Is there pressure on Garrett this year? He used to like to fire coaches, if you'll remember early on. Yes. But what works for him with Jason Garrett, and I say this to everyone who doesn't cover this team and who isn't really on the inside, players talk to me pretty freely, and not one of them has ever lost faith in Jason Garrett. Say what you will about him. He is consistent in the way he delivers his message and the way that he expects players to respond. And so until he loses that locker room, I still feel like the seat is lukewarm. You know, we keep talking about it's the hot seat. It's the hot seat. I do think that this year it's a little bit warmer than before, but I also think he can also point to the fact he's got Kellen Moore and John Kitna now in that offensive position. Now, I will tell you there's a lot of optimism about this new offense. There's a lot of optimism about John Kitna. There's a lot of optimism about Kellen Moore. They're dressing things up differently pre-snap. That's what we've been seeing. And then what we love about John Kitna so far is Dak Prescott's looking like a different quarterback. Where he struggled was his mechanics in the pocket. It yeah. wasn't so much, much when he was making the loose plays. Yeah, by the way, that, that's why his accuracy concerns me, is that his mechanics go, Matt Stafford has this problem, mechanics go, accuracy goes. Right. Well, John Kitna was all about preaching the footwork. This is where your elbow goes. This is where your foot goes. And I was told as recently as yesterday, Dak Prescott was up there working out with guys like Michael Gallup and Jason Witten. And so... There is this excitement. It seems like his confidence has grown a little bit more. I will just point out that Scott Linehan, there was a lot of frustration with him yes. for the last couple of years. Des Bryant was the first one to sound the alarm. 
Then it was Bryce Butler, Terrence Williams, Cole Beasley, all who are no longer in Dallas. But everyone that I've talked to has told me that Kellen Moore is incredibly inclusive and John Kitten is sort of the, Kellen schemes it up, Kellen that then John Kitten is sort of, essentially make sure that it's implemented. Yeah. So it's an interesting dynamic. But again, to answer your question, if there's a better coach out there that Jerry thinks he can go get, I think he makes the move. But until you present that coach to me, I don't see them moving on from Jason Garrett. Jason Witten, why bring him back? What's the, what's the MO there? And I was told inside the building they were a little split on this because they like seeing the development of a guy like Blake Jarwin. Blake Jarwin was a guy that was on the practice squad. Yeah. The Eagles wanted. Yeah. They kept him around. And if you watch that regular season finale against the Giants, he had the three touchdowns. They loved seeing where that was going. And their concern is Jason Witten never came off the field. Jason, what I respect about him is he knows his role coming back. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have the same locker. That's Zach Martin's now. He says he doesn't have his parking space. But he said he still felt like there was gas left in the tank. And I was back there in, I think it was March. Scott Hansen from NFL Network was visiting Dallas and said, I know you don't want to go up to the facility on your day off, but I want a tour of the Star in Frisco. So I took him up there, and at the training table in March was Jason Witten with his iPad, his book, just ready to go. Yeah. And so uh, I think bringing him back is going to be good in the sense that he's going to help coach up the young guys. He's going to be your Y option threat. He's a blocking threat while we still have some of these questions about the offensive line. But I think you're going to see him nurture and help develop some of those tight ends. And that's a good thing. You were the first to report, if I recall, Dak was not willing to take a pay cut. That was you, right? Mm -hmm. Jane Slater joining us for our radio audience, a reporter on NFL Network, lives in Dallas. Dallas Gerbel, Dallas young lady, by the way. That's where you're born and raised. Yeah. Good for what a, what a job for you. Way to go. Seahawks were never interested in me, despite <laughs> my Seattle heritage. Uh, good for you. Um, <laughs> So you reported that. When you talked, did you talk directly to Dak on that? Sources did on it. You, okay, sources. Mm -hmm. um, do you do you sense there's any growing um, animosity? Money changes people. Money no. conversations. You ever talk to money with your parents, your dad, your boss? There's a respect thing, 100%. You didn't feel that? I'm not getting that sense. And again, that goes back to, I think Todd France's agent and his team are trying to get him what he deserves. I mean, if you look at Carson Wentz and what he got paid, yeah. you could argue Dak has done more and been more durable in his time in Dallas. Oh, there's no question about that. So we start with Carson Wentz's contract. I don't think he's asking for anything outside of $36 million, but I think he's looking in the 30 to $32 million range. And when you look again at Carson Wentz, this is on the Cowboys. They should have gotten this deal done earlier if they wanted the hometown discount. But I was told that they are optimistic and hopeful that this contract gets done at training camp. Do Romo and Dak get along? It's my understanding they get along. I wouldn't say that they're best friends right. or go out in Dallas, but they're also at different points in their lives. I mean, Tony's got, what, three kids now? Uh, he's married. Dak's still young. I think that's why it was so easy for him to gel with this locker room. Things change as you get older. You have different responsibilities. There's a different dynamic. I don't know there to be any animosity there, but I don't know them to be the best of friends, if that makes sense. No, I think it totally does. It's very abrupt. I don't think Brady would be best friends with anybody that replaced him, regardless of if it was an injury or non-injury. Well, look at Aaron Rodgers and uh, Brett, Brett Favre. Favre. It's difficult. It took a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. Even Nick Foles and Carson Wentz. It's a kind of an uncomfortable conversation. Jane Slater is here. Uh, Cowboys training camp begins June, July 26 in Oxnard, California. Uh, by the way, you've got tons of information. You're incredibly well connected and it's great to have you on the show. When you go to camp with the Cowboys, so I've never been to their camp, but I hear about Jerry holding court at Nobu in Malibu. Oh, yeah. Jerry's the ultimate storyteller. Um, of all your work at the NFL Network and covering, what's a Cowboy camp would Jerry like to cover? Is it intense? Is it chill? What's it like? Jerry is probably one of the most dynamic people I've ever been around. I always tell people he reminds me of Walt Disney. You were an ESPN employee. So yes. you re remember we go through rookie rookie boot camp and right. I remember studying about Walt Disney when we were there yeah and he is enig enigmatic that way in the sense that he is a sort of the Imagineer yeah. and it's when he wants something or believes something he speaks it into existence right and he does have this way of spreading optimism when you're around him so as a reporter you're always you try to be careful with that right like right. what is optimism what's the truth what I think I've always respected about him is the way that he treats the players and the way the players revere him moving forward. They do. They do, because he looks at them as sort of family. And I appreciate that. I mean, you saw that with, I mean, even Des and Jerry, when all of that went south, it was Des felt that he could just call up Jerry and talk to him. And I thought that was neat because you don't always see that in a lot of organizations. But 
probably the best part of training camp as a reporter is this private party he puts on at Nobu. All the reporters get to come. He serves you appetizers and drinks. And sometimes you get the celebrities that show up. There's always celebrities at camp. Uh, so it's just, it's different. When you go to other training camps, there's just nothing like it. It's, I appreciate the fact that it's going to be, that I'll be a part of this footnote of history with Jerry. You know, the, the offensive line has been the centerpiece of this organization for years. It is now getting older. It's very expensive. And there's more injuries. It would, my sense is outside the organization. We're talking about young pieces, but the concern in the building is that offensive line going forward. Do you sense that? I think there's obvious question marks. Travis Frederick with Guillaume Barre last year came out of absolutely nowhere. Nowhere. Uh, you know, he had started with the stinger at camp. Then we're hearing he doesn't have feeling in his hands and feet, which of course is important when you're the center of an offensive line. And then he told me that he felt that he could have played at the very, very tail end of the season. Oh, so he did. He did, but he said that they wanted to obviously be careful with it. And then what he did was he never actually walked away from the team. He was on the sidelines uh, all of last year. He took on a sort of a coach hybrid role. He was always in the classroom. He was intimately involved in Joe Looney's development, who I, I would submit that Joe Looney did a pretty good job at yeah. center last year. Yeah. Um, but at least now you've got a lot of depth there at that position. Connor Williams, they're sort of moving him guard tackle. I've been told he's been putting on some some weight. I don't know if that translates into making him a better player. Uh, Tyron Smith, we saw that he was breaking down a little bit last year. The way that they're addressing that is these veteran days off at camp and yeah, OTAs. The, the Rams have done that. The Rams have taken a much less uh, uh, much less daunting camp. So Dallas is doing that to their older old They've linemen. done that for a while. I mean, they've Sean Lee, Jason Witten, Tyron Smith, Zach Martin, Travis Frederick have always sort of fallen in that category. Sure. Well, what a pleasure to meet you. By the way, one of my producers um, found this picture from us from the Super Bowl in New Orleans a few years ago. The discouraging part is I look so dynamic at that point, and I have just fallen apart. Look at me. Well, Joy. there's a story behind that, Colin. I was a big fan of you and Michelle Beadle on your show. Yeah. And so I had a sports talk show in Dallas, Elf and Slater, and, of course, that's morning. So morning shows are always rough at Super Bowl, as you know. I believe yeah. this was after the media party, so. Was I nice? You were incredibly nice, but I, I'm i pretty sure I just grabbed you and <laughs> said, I want a picture, and can you join my show? And, of course, you were busy that day. So I, I appreciate the fact that I'm here today. Um, but, yeah, I pulled that picture up from six years ago, and here we are. Here we are. Uh, follow her at Slater NFL. Jane's going to be on the NFL Network's Inside the Training Camp coverage live starting tomorrow. This is just great stuff through August 7th each day at 10 a.m. We'd love to have you on again before camp closes. Come on down here. It's great seeing you. Great meeting you. Thanks so much for having me on. You bet. Joy with the news.